Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer again and ask that the Spirit of the Lord would come down and anoint because nothing that we say is going to do a bit of good no matter how much intelligence or knowledge or understanding it's God or wisdom that the words have without the Spirit. And I don't know why the Lord gave me this particular message for you because the Lord gave me this about a month ago and I just kept waiting for a place to preach it. But I jumped at the chance when they said that Brother Burroughs wasn't going to be here and that they needed somebody to preach and I didn't give Brother Chris a chance to say, well, I guess I'll go ahead and preach. <laughs> Sister Kathy took this morning service and uh, they said, go ahead, Sister Spivey, and take the night service. So that's why we're here. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it doesn't matter. Whoever is here, thank God. Three out of the bunch already know almost everything I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but that's all right. They'll hear it again because the Bible said, speak about the Lord when you go out and when you come in, when you sit down, when you lay down, when you stand up. Speak of him, speak of him often. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this service <clears throat> Thank you, God, for the opportunity to lift up your name because that's what we're doing. Lifting up the name of Jesus. God, I appreciate you for what you've done. Lord, this is my church family too, God. Lord Jesus, we've adopted this church just like we've adopted our own church. We love every single one of them, God. And I pray for those that didn't come. Often excuses, Lord. I'm troubled about their soul i'm not troubled that they don't come to hear me they don't come to church very often it's not me they'd be here if they were faithful to church but they're not here because they're not faithful to go to church and god i just pray that you would reach into the homes and trouble their spirits the ones that stayed home Trouble their spirits if they didn't have a really, really good, godly reason for staying home. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now tonight I'm going to preach to you something that we all want to hear, all of us. How many of you are not Christians? Raise your hand if you're not a Christian. Okay, so since we're all Christians, how many of you want to be so Winners for Jesus, a soul winner. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about how to win souls tonight. Actually, I'm not going to just talk about it. I'm going to preach tonight. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord is going to come on me and I'm going to preach. Amen. Now, I want to read to you. I'm going to do like David and just not give you a chance to find them. I'm sorry, but you know, I hadn't got time tonight. I got too much to say. These will be familiar scriptures anyway. Proverbs 11 30, 11 30. Part of that scripture says, he that wins souls is wise. Has anybody ever read that before that you remember reading it? Yeah. So what does it take to win souls according to this scripture? He that wins souls is wise. Well, it sounds like to me you got to be wise to win souls. Amen. So we're going to talk about how to get that wisdom from God of how to win those souls. Now, James 1 and 5 said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, or he doesn't chastise you, he doesn't shame you for asking and say, well, you should already know. He just helps you to have that wisdom. And it shall be given him, James said. If you ask for wisdom, so if you ask for the wisdom, see, King Solomon said, I want the wisdom to lead your people. 
If you say, God, I want the wisdom to win souls. The Bible said he'll give it to you. Now, I want to read to you in Matthew 13, 52. This is my main scripture. If you want to just not skip around in the Bible, you just keep it right here. I can assure you, you'll understand the entire message. If you just hold on to this, Matthew 13, 52. Then said he to them, therefore, every scribe who's instructed to the kingdom of heaven is like to a man that's a householder, which brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. Now, you see why I've got a treasure chest up here, don't you? All right, we're going to bring some treasures out tonight and take a look at them. That's what we're going to do. And these treasures that I'm going to bring out are going to help you to win souls. And I'm going to tell you why. You're a householder too. All of you are householders. You can't just have a new treasure and you can't just have an old treasure. If you've got a treasure chest, you have to have treasures new and old according to the Bible. He had treasures new and old. We've got a New Testament and we've got an Old Testament. So we've got old treasures and we've got new treasures. And we don't throw the old away because we've got new, do we? A lot of people today don't keep the old. Oh, no, no, don't want the old. So they'll throw everything out for the new. And then when it don't work, you know, it's like they they threw away the uh, fireplaces when all the new Heaters came out and the new heating systems. Now some of them wish they had them when the electricity goes off. Because they hadn't got the old treasures, just the new. So now we're going to talk about bringing out your treasures, new and old, to win souls. Proverbs 15 and 6 says, In the house of the righteous is much treasure. So if you're a righteous person... You're going to have a lot of this treasure. What you got to do is go back to your treasure box, look at it, take it out, examine it, think about it, and know what a treasure you've got so you can bring it out when you're witnessing to people. Amen. One more scripture before I get started into this. John 21, 24, John himself said this. This is the disciple. In other words, I am the disciple. This is him. I am him, which testifies of these things that I just wrote to you. And I wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true. In other words, you know, my testimony is true. I wrote them. I testified of them and I know my testimony is true. I was there. I saw what I'm telling you. I testify to you all the things I wrote in the book of John. That's what the disciples did, didn't they? They wrote down all those things they'd seen. Moses wrote down all the things he'd seen and what God told him to do. Somebody had to write it down. Isaiah would ask the scribes to write down what he said. The kings would ask the scribes to write down. So at at the time you need to bring this treasure out, there it is. And if you have a bad memory and you can't think of all the things that God's done for you, then write them down. Amen. Get you a list that you can pull from and look back over them and say, look at that. I'd forgotten about that. When we started getting our list together and I started asking Brother Spivey, I said, I didn't show him my list. I said, just call out to me all the things in your life that you remember that God did that was so miraculous. And he started saying this and that and the other. And I I remembered some things I hadn't even thought about. Now, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to pull these treasures out of my chest and let you look at them. Is that okay? 
All right. All right, now, everybody's got their own treasure chest, so I'm not going to give Brother David's treasures. I'm not going to give Brother Terrell's treasures. I've got lots of those that from time to time I pull out with people. I was there when a man, you know, on dialysis was healed and he wet his pants, was embarrassed to come back in the tent. I was there. Well, okay, that's partly my testimony, but that's really Brother Terrell's treasure. But I'm going to tell you my treasure. A lot of my treasure includes my husband because he was there. But there are things that he has that I'm not going to include because they're his treasure. You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to exclude any of them. I, I love including people. But this time, I'm going to tell you what I know. I'm going to do like John. I'm going to show you what I've seen and heard. Amen. Praise God. I remembered the Bible said in Matthew 19, 29, that everyone that has forsaken houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Now, I'm going to start as my ministry began. I had a daddy who was a good wholeness preacher. But he did not believe in women preachers. And so when I went to him and told him that the Lord told me that I was called to preach, he told me he didn't believe in that. And when I later got to be about 19 years old, and I had been in subjection to him for several years after I told him. I went to him one day and I said, Dad, I'm called to preach. I'm not going to be the teacher that you're training me in college to be. I'm going to be a preacher. So I'm going to quit college unless you want to send me to a, you know, a college to learn the Bible. And he said, he didn't want to do that, and I'm thankful he didn't. Thank God he didn't ruin me. I didn't know back then. That would have ruined me. Give me an a icebreaker from my mouth here. <clears throat> Keep my mouth a little damp here. Keep my throat from being scratchy. So, as I started out the door, I was crying. I was probably the only one crying. Because I knew I was forsaking my mo mother and my father, houses, lands, everything. I had things that they claimed belonged to me, but by the time I even got back to visit them, that stuff was gone because I wasn't there. It wasn't mine anymore. I forsook everything. I lived out of my car for several years. Fortunately, I had some family members that were kind enough in between revivals to let me come and stay with them. And I never, except in Haiti, had to sleep on the street or in my car, except one night I chose to do that. Chose to sleep in my car. In Haiti, one night I slept on the street, and I'll probably tell you about that. But just before I started out, I needed everything. And I was in a service and I said, Lord, I need some money for a Bible. It cost about $20 back then for a good Bible. I need a Bible if I'm going to be a preacher. I need a Bible. I had a Bible, but it just, you know, it wasn't my Bible. A good Bible. Just a kid's Bible, maybe. But anyway, I didn't have a good Bible. So a man in a service because I'd played the music for his services, gave me $20. I knew that was my Bible money. You understand? I knew that was my Bible money. So, I took that money that he gave, 
Here's my first treasure. I began to, I began to go home thanking God for that. As I traveled home, the most beautiful feeling came over me. And I began to speak. I'd already had the Holy Ghost, but I began to speak in a fluent language I'd never heard. And it wasn't the money for the Bible that was my treasure. It was that Spirit of God that moved on me and gave me the Holy Ghost that night. And gave me those tongues. Shortly after that, as I was preaching, I discovered that I had something under my arm that was forming this big old lump. And I could reach and feel it. I had a coworker at that time that was traveling with me, and she said, oh, you better go to the doctor and have that examined. I said, no, no, no. When God gets ready, he's going to heal that. And I was in a little service one time. Man didn't know me. The woman didn't know me. They had all the young people over, and I went to be with some of my friends that were young. I was still very young. And when I went over there, the man looked at me and he said, I see something black under your arm. Raise your hands. God's going to heal it. And I raised my hands. He prayed a simple prayer. When he got through, he said, reach under your arm and see if it's there. And I reached and it was gone. That cancer, that cancer that first attacked me under my arm, God healed. Amen. Amen. And that's one of my old treasures. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. That's okay, I really didn't need him, but I appreciate you doing that. Now, as I began my ministry, I believed in healing. I believed in God doing miracles. And very, in the very beginning, God tested my faith. He told me to pray for a lady and said, she's got a headache. And I said, God, what if she ain't got a headache? It's going to be real embarrassing when I tell her she's got one. <laughs> And I didn't know what to do. I was young, just starting out. And I asked everybody just to stand on their feet and uh, praise the Lord. And as they were praising the Lord, I was walking down the aisle, praising the Lord. She was sitting about where Sister Mahalia is right now. I think the best I can remember. It's been a long time. And I said, Sister, I want to pray for you. Do you have a headache? She said, oh, please pray for me. I had one all day long. (laughs) Amen. Now, that increased my faith, and so I began to pray and seek God, and one night, a lady and I stayed up nearly all night praying. It was the pastor's wife, and the spirit of prayer came on her, came on me too, and we just stayed up all night, just almost all night. We'd start to go to bed. We'd get a cup of coffee, say, we're going to go to bed. Let's get a cup of coffee, and before we could get the coffee down, something else would come up. And we'd pray again. You know, the Spirit of the Lord would come up. Now, before I ever heard any of Brother Terrell's messages and knew about this ministry, while we were praying that night, hallelujah, a man in a black suit It looked just like a dressed up man. Sort of like you'd figure that Brother Chris would look like if he dressed up in a suit and a tie. I don't remember if he had on a tie, but he had on a black suit and a white shirt. He came up to me. I didn't see him in the flesh. I saw him in the spirit, but I I can tell you I felt it. He walked up to me and walked into me, inside of me. And he said, you're back. I'm making your back my back so you'll be strong against the devil. And I can tell you, even my family sometimes gets upset with me how strong I stand on things I know when it's right. And I have to tell them, look, this is God speaking, not me. So they don't get upset with me because I don't bend. It's not me, I'm telling you. 
And he told me, he says, your hands will be my hands and you'll pray for the sick. He said, your eyes will be my eyes to see the needs of the people. Now, that's the three things he told me, and that's exactly what God did. That revival that I was running at that time, a man came up to me and said, I want to quit smoking. And I prayed for him, and I said, God, the next time he takes a cigarette and tries to smoke it, let him get sick. To his stomach. The next night before I could even get into the church building. He came up to me. He says, hey, I want to know what you did to me. Whatever you did, I want you to undo it. I said, what do you mean? He said, you prayed for me that every time I'd smoke a cigarette, I'd get sick. And every time I try to smoke, I'd throw up. And whatever you did, I want you to undo it. And that ministry that God gave me that night. Is that old treasure? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> God called me to go to Haiti. Well, let me tell this first. I'm sorry I'm getting this backwards. My daddy, even though he didn't want me to be a preacher, he didn't want me to be a hazard on the road either. So he wanted me to have a new car instead of those old clunkers I was driving. And so he didn't give me a car, but he went and helped me pick one out and get low payments and all that. And he got a lease car where I would have a year's warranty on it, a car that had been leased, but they'd sell it new. So I got that car and I drove that car for the Lord. And one time I decided I'd go visit my sister in that car and she lived uh, she lived in two different states, so I'm not sure which state she lived in at that moment, either Arkansas or Missouri. They're side by side. One of those, but I had to go up some real hilly country to get to her house. And as I began to go, all of a sudden that engine started going. Now, any man in here, I wasn't a man. But any man in here knows you'd stop that car. Right then, you wouldn't drive another step. If David hears that on the computer, he says, turn it off now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't turn it back on. Don't. <laughs> so I didn't know any better because I'm a woman, right? So I didn't know what was wrong with it. I looked for a service station, but I'm on these windy, hilly roads where... They don't have service stations. You've been out in Tennessee where you can't find nothing a lot of times or through the Blue Ridge Mountains, ain't nothing there till you get to the right place. So I saw a little place where you could get something to eat and I thought, well, there's probably a man there that can tell me what's wrong though. You know, men are, would help women back then. So I pulled in and I turned it off and went in and I said, is anybody here that knows anything about a car? My car is making a noise. Uh, I don't know too much about a car, but I'll come look. So the man came out and he said, turn it on. I turned it on. He says, whoa, whoa, turn it off. Turn it off. You can't drive this car. You can't go nowhere. I don't know what's wrong, but you can't go nowhere. I said, oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. So when he got back inside the store, I said, Jesus, you know, I got to go in this car. I ain't got no other car. I ain't got the money to fix it. There's no place around to fix it. I got to do what I got to do. So, Lord, I'm going to drive this car. I turn that key on, and it goes clunk, 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 all the way to my sister's house, maybe 100 miles more. I don't know. Then she wanted me to carry her children down to Florida. So I carried them to Florida to visit their grandparents. Before my next revival, I had that time off, so I carried them. She was willing to pay the gas, I think, for me to do that. So the whole way, that car's going clunk, 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 clunk. So I get into my dad's house, and I say, Dad, my car's making a noise. Well, we better have that thing checked out then. So we carried it into the dealer. He replaces the motor and says, it's a good thing you got here. Today is the last day of your warranty. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! 
I love that old testimony there. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Now, just about then, I thought I was a pretty seasoned preacher, and I'd been to Haiti a couple of times just with another man that and his family that were just going to carry things to Haitians, and you had to carry them. You couldn't send them because they'd steal them out of the mail. So as I was there, though, the Lord impressed me to go on a missionary trip. <clears throat> and so I decided to go down there. I'm going to backtrack from this a little bit in a minute. But I decided to go. And while I was there, the first thing that I noticed as I got off the plane was this horrid, horrid smell everywhere. Everywhere you went, this hard smell. And I found out that they didn't have any sewage. They didn't have any running water except maybe one or two faucets, most of those in the uh, hotels. And the people were about as poor as you could think to get. And God used me to preach to those people, but I had to, I had to make a decision. I had come into Port-au-Prince, the big city where everybody went to preach that came in there. And it was so much like missionary work that you just thought you were really doing something for the Lord. But I realized that the people out in the villages had never heard any of the gospel. And so I said, I'd love to go out to the villages, but I don't know who can go out there with me and help me to find the churches and whatever. I'd like to get an open door. And one of the men said, well, I've been to America. I'm a native. I can translate for you, and I've got several churches out in the country. I want you to come preach. So we went to one of his churches. We had to travel as far as a half a, half a uh, tank of gas because there wasn't any gas stations. And go the rest of the way the best we could. Then we came back and drove half a tank back where they could refill when we got through with the revival. And then we went in the opposite direction. We went up the mountains for his other church. When we started up this mountain, we were in what they call a bus. It's actually a truck with no sides on it. And you can fall out just as easily as you can fall in. And we were going around the mountains and looking down on tops of the trees. <laughs> and we wound around and we'd go across the river. And then we'd wind again and we'd go back across it the other way. Then we'd wind around and we'd go back across it this way. And finally they said, well, the river is swollen and we can't go any further tonight. We're going to have to wait till in the morning when the river goes down. And I look around, and here's one little building, one little stone building. I said, do they have any motels around here? Nope. Got any place to spend the night? Nope. Well, the Lord had blessed me with somebody with enough knowledge to loan me an army cot. And so I asked them to get my army cot off of the top of the bus. And I stretched that army cot out. And there must have been 100 to 200 people walking around. Others on the bus that couldn't get anywhere too. Natives. I was the only American. The only white person. And here I am, a single woman, out in the middle of nowhere in Haiti. And I laid down that night on that army cot. And slept like a baby. Because God was with me. He's the one that sent me. Had a good revival. <clears throat> now I told you that I told you I was a single lady at that time. And I'd been praying. I didn't want to ruin my ministry with a bad marriage or with a broken marriage. And I can tell you now, it's a good thing I prayed because even in a good marriage, you got times you have to go through, you know. You left your hair in the sink. Well, when you shaved, you didn't clean yours out either. That didn't, that didn't happen to us, but it does to some people, you know. <laughs> I'm married to a man that tries to clean it up real good, and I can't stand hair in the sink either. But there's always something. 
So I wanted God to show me. And one day I was, I was in a home in between revivals and the Lord spoke to me, said, go to the bedroom. I'm fixing to talk to you. So I just slipped off to the bedroom. Anytime I did that, they knew I was praying. They didn't open the door. If it was in the daytime, they just let me alone. So I closed the door to the bedroom, sat down on the bed and opened my Bible. And the Lord began to speak to me. I had asked him about this boy that I knew was fixing to ask me to go out with him. And he said, no, he's not the one. Don't bother with him. I'm not going to go into all the detail. You see, I don't have time. I got to get to my new treasure. <laughs> but anyway, the Lord began to speak to me and told me that I would find a man that would be musical. He'd be a minister. He told me all these things about him that were personal that I don't even go into. I don't give his side of it because that's his testimony. I kept looking and looking for this man and the Lord said, the place you least expect to find him, that's where you're going to find him. And when I did find him, he was in a little small church and had gotten saved under the same minister that was preaching when I got saved. The very same one, right close to my own hometown where I was born, within 60 miles of it. And I, I liked him, but he was younger than me. And I, not to go into all that story, I just don't have time. I wish I did, but you know, y'all are all married. You don't need this as much as David, and he's heard it many times. But when God finally opened my eyes, I was so shook up. It was at the end of the revival. I'd been invited to his house for a spaghetti supper with the rest of the church. And I was sitting on the organ inspecting his organ and he was changing the sounds and recording our conversations. And I didn't know that. Still got that tape somewhere. <laughs> and there we were sitting there when it hit me and I literally drew my breath. <gasps> this is him. <gasps> and the whole church that had been cheerleaders for us all along. <laughs> In fact, I'd teased the pastor's wife. I'd found a scripture. that her, We called her Sister Bird. That wasn't her name, but we called her Sister Bird because she kept telling from one to the other what each other would say, you know, <laughs> passing it back and forth. And I, I found a scripture that said, the bird of the air will tell the matter. And I said, you Sister Bird, that's who you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so after I drew my breath and the whole church realized what was wrong, it kind of got a little simpler from that point on. And Ron and I, within a week, were talking about getting married. Now, at that point, <laughs> I'll tell you what. At that point, that was about the sweetest thing that had ever happened to me. Amen. 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 And... Because he was young in the Lord, he wanted to really pray and seek God about not making a rash decision. He's not a rash person. There's a couple of people that have ministered to him in the spirit and said he's very careful. And anybody that's been around him can testify to that. Very careful person. So he wanted to be very careful. Now I'm going to tell this story. This is a funny story. He called me up one time when I was, I just told him, okay, well, look, if we're not going to set the date right now, I can't just wait around. I'm going to go preach for the Lord. I'm not going to tell you where I am because we didn't have cell phones back then. I couldn't just call him up every few minutes and tell him where I was. Didn't have a phone to tell him. So I just said, you know what? If you want to find me, you'll find me. Amen. Amen. So I happened to be in a place one time and he located me, called me up got on the phone. He says, well, I just think, you know, that we ought to test this out and we ought to date other people. And the spirit of the Lord came on me. And I said, that's right. 
you're right. I want you to date her. Because if you like her, you don't like me. And if you like me, you don't like her. He says, who? I said, I know who she is. Who? I said, I don't know her name, but she's that girl that sings with the Assembly of God group. You know, she's so-and-so and so-and-so. Well, yeah, I'd kind of like to go out with her and test it out. Well, I want you to. Well, it wasn't long till he was saying, go ahead and say it. I told you so. <laughs> but still, we didn't really set a date. And I was in a revival. Brother, Sister Bloodsworth was preaching. Brother and Sister Bloodsworth had a tent revival. I'd never met them. I still didn't know much about Brother Terrell's ministry. I just knew that the Lord had brought me into worshiping on the Sabbath day. I was at that. Actually, I wasn't even at that point, I don't think, at that time, but during that period of time. So, Sister Bloodsworth called me out, and she said, you back there in the back, stand up. God's got something he's wanted to give to you, and the devil's trying to take it away from you, but the Lord's not going to let him. I didn't know what she was talking about. I honestly didn't. I just said, okay, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because I was working in that city with a church, I got a little job so they wouldn't have to pay my way. And I was on that job when I got a phone call. And Ron says, hi, how you doing? Actually, no, letter first. Okay, first the letter. He, uh, he wrote a letter, and like I said, I was working with this man. I'm the one that got the mail every morning, and I didn't get but one bill. That was my light bill, so they'd put the light bill in that man's box because I didn't have a box. I didn't have a mailbox, and so they'd send my light bill to my uh, boss's box. So the letter came, Route 1, you follow Alabama. Now, he had seen my... Cousin in town, one of them, one out of the 60 that I've got, first cousins. And uh, he said, well, have you seen Juanita lately? Well, I heard she's in, you fall, Alabama. Do you know where she is? Well, I, I don't know. I think it's Route 1. So he wrote, Route 1, you fall, Alabama, and the man put it in my box. Right after Sister Bloodsworth prophesied to me. And he started calling me, and within three months, we were married. Woo! I wish I had a bigger coin. Look at that right there. Now, <laughs> woo! I wish you had more patience, and I wish I had more time. <laughs> In that city... I'm going to go through this really quickly. In that city, um, there was a lady that had let me stay with her, but I realized if I was going to work there consistently, I didn't need to be a bother to her. So I looked for my own place, and somebody told me, said, well, why don't you just buy a trailer? I said, I don't have any money. Well, the man that we went to look you know, on the lot, he said, how much money extra do you have? I says, I couldn't pay more than $85 a month for a trailer, and you ain't got nothing like that. He says, well, let me check around. And he found a foreclosed trailer. And I said, I can't afford it. I said, I'd have to have furniture in it. I don't have money to buy furniture. I'd have to have a washing machine. I couldn't even wash my own clothes. He said, okay, what if I put furniture in it and a washing machine? And for $85 a month, the Lord gave me that trailer. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. That was the first of several houses that he gave us. The others, some of them for free. All right. Now, when I was dating Ron, we were talking about getting married I realized I had something missing. 
See, my dad had a hernia and my mother always had to do the cooking. And dad never wanted me to cook. And everywhere I went, they didn't want me to stay in a motel because I was a single lady. They wanted to watch after me. So either the pastor or some faithful member of the church would ask me to come to their home like Brother Chris did. And, we'd, and I'd stay with them. And so they would do the cooking and they'd say, no, you just spend your time preparing for the services. Don't bother with the food. I'll do that. Never got a chance to cook. I didn't know how to cook. The first meal I ate in that trailer, I had a little crock pot. And in that little crock pot, I put a can of green beans and a can of... Uh, what do you call those onions, those fried onions things? French onion rings or whatever they call them. Opened up a little, a little can of them, poured them together, ate it and said, thank you, Lord, I'm not starving. Woo! Hallelujah. But I couldn't cook. So <laughs> I went to my employer. I said, you know, you're not giving me enough to even buy hamburger meat. After I pay my bills, he said, well, figure on how much, uh, how much would it take to buy hamburger? I said, well, it's about $5, you know, for hamburger meat. He said, well, figure on a $5 raise a, a week with the taxes taken out. And that's what he raised my pay, $5 a week. But with that $5 a week, I started praying. I said, God, you know, you got you to gotta give me some food. I ain't got no money to buy food. Couldn't cook it. What am I going to do with it? But I found a little, I got to include this with several different things. I just got all kind of little treasures on this one. I'm going to throw in there. That's the old ring, the old button. A few of these old coins, and these are really old coins that I'm showing you. A really old button here. Um, the Lord gave me some secrets about food that started way back then. And I'm leading up to a food miracle. I'll probably go faster when I get to the point where y'all all know the stories. And if I don't, then we'll be here for a few hours. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But the Lord told me to go to the chicken place there and say, when you cut up your chicken, do you have any parts that you throw away? Well, yeah, we throw away the necks. And I don't know what they, else they said, but I remember the necks. I said, well, you, do you mind if I can have them? And I just thought I'd get a little bag every once in a while. They brought me out this 40-pound box of stuff. And I said, thank you, Jesus. What am I going to do with it? And the neighbor across the street said, you know, I got a freezer. You can just, it's outside my door. You can just put it out there and just come get it anytime you want to. That's what I did. And I lived off of chicken necks. I learned how to cook them. I learned how to make gravy with them. I learned how to make some good meals out of them. And from that, I learned some secrets about getting food that either didn't cost anything or that cost very little. And by the time I started dating Ron again, and he came to my house and I had to fix him a meal, he was saying, oh, you are such a wonderful cook. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And that's what people say today. I still have that gift God gave me of putting things together, never following a recipe. It just pains me to have somebody try to read a pet recipe to me. I don't understand it. I can't follow it. I can't do it. Just leave me alone. Let me cook. <laughs> because that's a gift the Lord gave me. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Woo. So Ron and I married. Now we're moving on up. Moving on up. I had to sew my own clothes to have some clothes because, you know, when you first get married, I don't, you can't make enough money to buy everything. You need everything. 
And if you don't need it, you look at your spouse and you say, they need it, I got to buy it for them. So I was making my own clothes to save money. And that's one of the things the Lord told me was that I'd make my wedding dress. We would make it and we did. I made my own wedding dress. And so that was one of those things the Lord told me the first time he told me about the husband I would meet. So I'm going down to the store to try to buy some buttons. <laughs> and I'm in Hancock's. And I'm looking around and I said, well, here's some buttons on sale. Oh, but look, they're on the cards, but they're missing a button. Like they might have three buttons instead of four. I can't make nothing out of that. Let's look in the bottom, see if we can find these loose buttons. Maybe we can match some of these. I tried to scramble and you couldn't even get to the bottom. It was this big old box like that, full of buttons. And I said, this ain't going nowhere. I can't find these. Why don't you find the manager? And ask him how much he would take for this box of buttons. And we can take them home and put them together. And he said, what, the whole box? I said, you can just, just ask. Now the Bible says, James 4, 2, just so you know where it is. You have not, you have not, because you don't ask. Thank you. So we asked, and the man said, I don't know, maybe $30. I said, Ron, write him a check now. <laughs> what, you want this whole box? Write him a check. <laughs> he had no idea. I took them buttons home and spread them out in our little trailer, that same trailer, spread them out on the floor and started matching those buttons we had over 3,000 cards of buttons besides the buttons that were the same button that we'd string on a string and have a hundred of them here and there. I separated them out by color. I couldn't figure out how to do it. Maybe by size that didn't work. I said, okay, color. So <laughs> I had every kind of button. This is just a sample that I've still got from them buttons. I some of them buttons. See your sister Haley. Ain't them things pretty. These were coat buttons and that was the dress buttons. Yeah, they're more valuable now. I've actually sold some of them to a lady, paid me way more than than that for the part she she got. Huh? Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> so there's my buttons. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible said in Deuteronomy 28 and 4, Blessed shall be the fruit of your body. I have right here a $2 bill that's not just a $2 bill. I believe it's also, tell me how this was special. Didn't we have a series of these? A series of them where they were consecutive numbers. And we've saved these for a number of years. This is something, sure enough, valuable. $2 bill. Ron and I had tried to have children, but I couldn't bear a child to term. And so you know the story. We went across Brother Terrell's prayer ramp. Brother Terrell said, I decree a miracle in your womb and that you'll have a boy in the name of Jesus. And we had a boy. We didn't have a girl. We had a boy. And I'm going to... We had a boy. We had a boy. We had a boy. We had a boy. We still got a boy. Amen. We got a boy. Now, during that time, Brother Terrell said, 
You need to take your children out of school and teach them at home. And you know what everybody said? Oh, yes, Lord, I'm going to obey the Lord. I'm going to do what I can, and the Lord will help me to do it. No, they did not. They said, I'm not a teacher. I don't know how to teach my children. I didn't do that. I talked to my husband. I said, look, we'll use one car. You won't have to buy David's school clothes. We'll save money on food because I'll be cooking at home. And we're going to do it. So I started out when David was two and a half years old. And God taught him how to read when he was two and a half. But when he got to school age, I said, God, the Bible said that Daniel purposed in his heart not to keep, eat the king's meat. And when he did, he was fairer and fatter than all the rest of the children of Israel and all the rest of the captives. Now, I want you to do that for David, my son, because we're obeying you and I want him to learn and learn more than those kids in school. When we tested him, his testing was off the chart. And I've got to tell this story. He did not know whether he was smart or dumb. He just knew he was learning. That's all he knew. I didn't tell him he was smart. I didn't tell him he was dumb. I just said, good job, or you need to work on that. That's all I'd tell him. But God was working with him. One day we were going down the road to the church. And David, about nine years old, was in the back seat. And he said, oh, mama, what is that smell? See, he'd ask me any question because I was the teacher. I was always the teacher. Wherever we went, I was the teacher. So he asked me the question. If I wanted to get Ron to answer it, I'd say, well, your daddy knows about that, and I don't. He can answer. But at that point, I said, uh, well, that's a um, pulp mill where they make paper and that's the smell you're smelling is the chemicals they use to break down that wood to make the paper he said well why don't they use an electrostatic precipitator <laughs> and i'm like i don't know what that is <laughs> yeah oh oh did i just hear what i heard and we didn't honestly know how to answer him. And later on, God did send somebody that answered his question. It was a good question, and he got a good answer. But at that point, God told me and let me know, or showed me, that God was taking care of his education, and there was no lack. Just because he was homeschooled didn't mean anything. So I'm going to add that treasure in. Now... You can see I'm getting more current now. I'm only 33 years behind. Maybe 30 by the, now. Somewhere along in there. <clears throat> Just about the time David was born and I was starting to teach him these uh, to read, we were in a little place called Haleburg, Alabama, where he was born. I'm going to tell this, then I am really going to go fast forward here. Um... In this little place, we were trying to buy a house, like Brother Terrell said, in the country. We didn't have any money. We had to borrow it from an individual to get it. We had to buy a really cheap house, which meant it was a do-it-yourselfer, which meant it never got done. <laughs> we didn't have any money to do anything with it. And there was a hole in the roof in the kitchen where the chimney used to be, and they'd taken it out. It had subflooring on the floor, and somebody had thrown a trowel down where it looked like they'd started to work and just said, okay, I'll just stick it right there till I come back to it, and it was still there. And Ron picked that up and looked around the house and said, is this the trowel of our faith? <laughs> so anyway, it was a trial. The house was a trial. And we didn't have anything to eat. The little old garden didn't make much of anything. It wasn't good soil. You know, we didn't have fertilizer worth anything. 
We were 30 miles from town. We couldn't even get into town to get welfare. Didn't want it anyway, but 20 or 30 minutes, in other words, to town. And we didn't know what to do. So we started praying. God, what am I going to do? And the Lord said, well, you know, you can eat those peanuts over there that they've, uh, that the, the picker has left. You know, they always leave. And so we went out in the field next door and picked up peanuts and shelled them, put them in my pressure cooker. And mother came to visit. And I said, oh, mother, we got a new dish for you to try. We're going to eat peanuts and cornbread and onion. And she ate that and said, this is wonderful. Now, how did I know that would work? Because I'm a cook. The Lord told me that would work. So it did. You hadn't tried that. You don't know, but we know. We ate it. It was good. So anyway, we were in that mode where we just knew, you know, we didn't have any food. I want to tell several different things here at this point. All at once. We had a brother there. Brother Spivey, would you come please rewrap these up in this napkin? In this uh, tissue. And <clears throat> this brother told us to go on a fast. He put us on a 21 day fast, and we both fasted 21 days. At the end of that 21 day fast, things began to happen real fast. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, just, oh, it was just amazing how fast things began to happen as David was just a little child, not even, maybe even a year old. And so we were out of food. I'm going to tell you about this one. Then I'll go to another one. Right? Boom, boom, boom. We were out of food. And the Lord spoke to me. Just put it right here, babe. That's okay, right there. Uh -huh. The Lord spoke to me and he said, give me half your food. And I said, well, Lord, you sure won't get much. But I did. I'd say ketchup for you, mustard for me, one spice for you, one spice for me, pears for you, pears for me. And I separated out whatever I had. And we put it in our little car. Can't go into that. Don't have time. And took that with us and took it where the Lord said to give it. Within a week, our floor in our kitchen and dining room were flooded with produce and fruit. And we took that and began to can it. We knew we could eat that. I mean, I can live off of vegetables. And we started canning that up. And I probably canned about 800 jars that season off of that miracle. We went out of town to do a little work for Ron's mother. And either, I believe it was on the way back, we decided we'd stop at the grocery store. We were feeding David macaroni and cheese sometimes. And so I wanted to get some cheese that had a sale on cheese. I'll back up to tell you how we got this money, but we only had $12. And so from that $12, we said, well, let's get some cheese. And we did, dollar a package for the cheese. And as we were driving out of the grocery store, going behind the store and going around, something caught my husband's eye. And he said, do you see something looks like gold sticking out of that ice over there? I said, yeah. Well, i got to investigate what that is. I'm curious. So, you know, my husband's an investigator. He's going to investigate anything like that. So he went over there. He says, oh, Juanita, we got to go back inside and tell this manager. What? He said, somebody's stealing cheese. There's just probably 100 packages of cheese out there in that ice. Somebody's fixing to take this home. They're stealing this cheese probably. And i got to go tell the manager. So we went back inside and told the manager, he did. And the manager said, no, actually, our cooler went out. We're not allowed to sell that cheese. If you want it, you can take all you want. So we took about 100 packages of cheese and put it in our freezer. Now, that was one thing out of the food miracle God put us under that brought to us meat, desserts, Fruit, vegetables, anything you can ask for. I told the Lord one time, I said, the only thing I can think of that you have provided for us free of charge 
is oysters because I thought about that I'd made Brother Terrell some oyster stew one time. Within a week or so, David walked in and says, what was that you said about the oysters? And he brought in two cases of oysters, free of charge. Amen, because I spoke it. Woo! I'm not going to tell about that money miracle because that's really Brother, Brother Spivey's testimony miracle. I'm going to keep going. During that time, though, God began to do some really wonderful miracles for us. We were living in that old house. We got about the best of my remembrance. This is old stuff, so I'm having to remember it from a long time ago. The best I remember, the lady that we borrowed the money from let us get about six thousand dollars behind in mortgage payments and i didn't know how we would ever catch up but we were praying we were praying and this lady came to us one day and she said my aunt died and she had cash money that nobody knew anything about but us and i'm really her heir i'm the only one i took care of her till she died and she left that money, and so your debt is paid on the house. Amen. Amen. And there's my second house key. Amen. Not too long after that, my dad got sick. And he wanted us to buy his house so that if he had to go to a nursing home, they wouldn't take the home place. And we didn't have money to buy the house, and I was so upset. That's one time I probably made a mistake with my husband because of how I felt toward my dad, not seeing a solution. This is the thing that I've learned later about women is we're real emotional. We can't think clearly like men do. Men are made to think. The only time I can think clearly like that and not make a mistake is when the Holy Ghost is on me and I'm in the spirit like I am right now. You don't have that woman feeling at that point. I'm telling you, you know what a man thinks like at that point. But after you're back out there, your emotions come back. So um, my husband and I had this discussion, but we decided that we would give in to my dad and he said, just give me whatever you can afford. I, I discussed it with him. I can't afford to buy it. Well, just give me whatever you can afford, and we'll make it up on a note, and you just pay it off as you can. And every year we'll check to see how much interest you owe and how much you still have left. And Okay, so I paid him some. We paid him some. And he died. And at that point, I went to my mother, and I said, Mother, you know why we bought this house with her with a life interest in it. So she'd have a place to stay. I said, we were just doing this to keep dad from worrying about the house. I don't want this house. I can never live in this house. This is not where God has put us in the ministry. And I love you, but I cannot pay. So I'm going to turn this back over to you. She said, no, that's okay. As long as I've got a life estate in it. I'll sign the deed over to you. And that house was free. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God sent us, before he sent us to Quitman, he sent us to Valdosta. We had no idea why we were in Valdosta. And I can tell you now... There was no reason we were there except for God to tell us where Quitman was. <laughs> That's the only reason we went there. We didn't do anything. We didn't have a ministry there. Nobody opened the doors. They didn't know what we could do. We didn't sing. We didn't play. We didn't preach. But just one or two times anywhere 
Anywhere we went in and said, we'll be a part of your church, we were never a part of it. We even offered in one church. I said, I'll tell you what, this bathroom needs some upgrade. We'll pay for the upgrades and we will upgrade this bathroom and make it beautiful. He said, no, I don't think I want you to do that. Just leave it alone. Okay. So we were not received. The only reason we were there is to get to Quitman. There went my other house key in the treasure chest. All right. Praise God. <clears throat> now, the Lord gave us a couple of ministries there. One of them, of course, was to pastor a church. And we weren't having much success getting people into the church. And the Lord told us to fish in the Spanish Sea. That's what he told us. So I decided from the very beginning that since God's no respecter of persons, that we shouldn't single them out and have a different service because when you have a different service, sometimes you have a different doctrine too. I wanted them to hear the true doctrine of Jesus Christ. So we tried to get a couple of uh, interpreters and everybody would fizzle out and I finally got tired of that and I came up in Brother Terrell's prayer line and said, I want you to give me I want God to give me the ability to speak Spanish. And so I read the Bible. That's how I learned it. I read the Bible. I read their Spanish Bible. And we started having church with them and I started preaching in their own language. And I started saying, well, Lord, you know, I'm trying to find on the web these Spanish songs so we can sing Spanish songs and learn them too so we can sing with them. But I'm not having much success. And so it looks like I'm just going to have to write a song. So you remember that song that I sang when I was here? I will arise and go to my father. Now listen at that song. Here's this old treasure right here. See those old wrinkled pages? That old paper. Me levantaré y iré a mi padre. Me levantaré y iré a mi padre. Cuántos siervos en la casa de mi padre tienen abundancia de pan. Y yo aquí perezco de hambre. Me levantaré y iré a mi padre. And that was what I wrote before I wrote it in English. Amen. Because God gave me the song. There's my treasure. Ooh, I love that one. I treasure that one. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then God sent us to the nursing home. Doesn't matter to me if people can give an offering or not. And they can't do that in a nursing home. And we had several... Miracles there, I don't have time to really tell you about a lot of them, but several different unusual, miraculous things. One of them was that a lady that was there had never really been in church at all. And she would follow us around from the minute we would walk in, she'd walk with us and see where we went. It didn't matter where we went to have church, she'd sit down and have it with us. And she got saved during our ministry there. And she would cry because the Holy Ghost would come on her. And she wouldn't know why she was crying because she wasn't used to church. There was another lady that had Alzheimer's. We didn't know we were going in the Alzheimer's section at one point there. We just knew it was a section. We went in there and some people were really bad off. Some were very well. Some of them it was just starting dementia and so forth. And we began to preach to them that you don't have to have this Alzheimer's mind. You can have the mind of Christ. And that Jesus Christ will bring all things to your remembrance like he did for the disciples. And as we would preach that, we would see these people improve. Now the way Alzheimer's works is that you remember the oldest things, the oldest treasures, 
but you forget what happened a few minutes ago. Then you can't remember what happened a week ago. Then you can't remember what happened a month ago. And it goes backwards like that. So when we would tell them things, it was difficult if the Lord didn't bring it back to their remembrance for them to remember. So one day, David came to preach. And they said, where's your mom? And he said, well, she's got a cold, so she's not going to come back till she gets over her cold. So the next week I was back, and they all rush at me at the door. Oh, Sister Spivey, are you over your cold? Think about what I just told you. Think about that. These people are not supposed to remember a week ago. Sister Spivey, all those people there. Where's your cold? One man was in his room and couldn't come out. Very sick. He opened his Bible up and he began to pray. God, send somebody to me. Send somebody to me. We walked to the door. We didn't even, even announce ourselves. We didn't even announce who we were. We walked to the door. Brother Spivey stood in the door and he says, come on in, I've been calling for you. I've been calling for you. Woo! Woo! And we got a chance to pray with that man, read the Bible with him, have some good times with him. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I have all these old treasures and now some new treasures I'm going into. I'm in the new treasures now. I want to tell you something about your own testimony, about saving people. That's what we started out as. When you're trying to win souls, you must have a testimony. And you must have some treasures with you. The Word of God in the beginning can be your only treasure. But eventually, you've got to have a testimony that that Word worked for you. You've got to be able to tell them, I know. Because they're going to tell you, you think so-and-so was healed, but they sprinkle something on them. you got to be the one to say, let me tell you something. Two and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And the doctor said I wouldn't live without chemotherapy and radiation. But Brother David Terrell called me on the phone and said, you'll recover completely. And the doctors are continuing two and a half years later to do every test they can think of. And the tumor markers are down to normal in the blood. The bones are reconstituting, although they say that's not possible. The cancer is not lighting up so much on the screen the darkness, in other words, that hides and makes it look lighter, is smaller. See, when something's in the way, it lights up light because it's like a re reverse image. So that cancer is smaller, not lighting up as much. But she said that couldn't happen with medicine. My arm swelled up till it was, I can't tell you how big it was now from lymphedema because they took out lymph nodes out from under my arm and the waist has no place to go. It swelled up so bad until my fingers wouldn't close. It was hurting so bad I looked at the wound care nurse and I said, well, what's going to happen to my arm? Is there anything you can do? There's nothing we can do. Well, what do you think's going to happen? She looked at my husband. She says, I said, is it going to swell up till it busts open? She said, yes. She said, Mr. Spivey, <laughs> sometimes God just calls his angels home. And you need to put her into a place where they can take care of her. A hospice where they can take care of her and won't let her suffer. Brother Spivey walked out of the room, called David to pray. When he got back in, I said, I'm not having that. 
They've done not one thing, not one, th not even, not even put a sleeve on here like they did at one time. They've done nothing. This arm is going down. Amen. Amen. No medicine whatsoever to do that. Amen. Woo. I have witnessed to so many nurses, so many doctors. Woo. 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 Hallelujah. Hold on. Here's all my new testimonies right here. Here they are. Now, got a couple more treasures to show you, and we're finished. I got one wrapped up in this gold paper because it's the most important one. It's just a little old, old, old penny. Let me show you. Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm not questioning the Lord now. <laughs> Woo! <clears throat> Hang on while I find it. Here we go. Matthew 20 and 1. Verse 1 says, For the kingdom of heaven is like to a householder which went out to hire laborers into his vineyard. <laughs> Verse 10 said, They received every man a penny. That's my penny right there that the Lord gave me. This is everlasting life. This is what this is. This is my treasure. Everlasting life. That's why I put it in the gold paper. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Luke chapter 6 verse 45 says this, a good man, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, goes on to say. Now if you've got a treasure in your heart, you're going to share that treasure with other people because out of the good treasure of your heart, that mouth's going to speak. Don't you be concerned and worried about witnessing to people. Just bring forth out of your treasure of your heart. Speak out of your heart. Amen. Lift up Jesus because he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. You don't do it. He does it. Just lift him up. Because the Son of Man came to save that which was lost, didn't he? Every other treasure that I own is right here. And before I gave this little demonstration at my own house, I had this sitting in my room by my desk with the Bible sitting in it. Because that's my treasure. When you go out witnessing, you carry your Bible... You put on your armor because this is your sword. You carry you some oil and or a blessed handkerchief or two because you might want to give something away. Something to leave with them that they can't wash off their head. <laughs> so you carry those things. I've got one thing right here, really important. Boy, that's really important. Does anybody know what that is? What does that look like, huh? Rock. Rock. This is my rock. Jesus Christ is my rock. Woo. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs>